Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Increase Cyber Resilience with Threat Hunting. My name is Lindsay with Argyle and it's great to have everyone joining us today. I have a few administrative details to share with you and then I'll turn things over to our STEAM speaker. First, we'd like to thank Rubrik for their partnership with today's event. They have been wonderful partners to Argyle and are committed to providing with valuable content and a great overall experience. So thank you again to Rubrik. We appreciate you joining us today. We welcome you to stay socially connected during today's event. For those who are active tweeters, please follow us on Twitter at Argyle Exec Forum and be sure to follow us on LinkedIn for special announcements. I also want to take a moment to touch on our content neutrality policy, which we've curated based on the feedback we've received over the years from our members. We've worked closely with our speaking faculty to ensure that you receive a set of balance and neutral viewpoints during the session today, and we appreciate our members' support of this policy. Finally, and most importantly, we want to hear from you, so please submit all questions that come up during today's event into the chat section of the interface. Following the discussion, we have set aside time for our speaker to weigh in on your questions. Now, without further delay, I would like to introduce our speaker. Today, we have Adam Turner, Cyber Resilience Architect with Rubric. We are pleased to have Adam here with us today for the webinar entitled, Increase Cyber Resilience with Threat Hunting. Welcome, Adam, and over to you. Thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your day around the world, wherever you may be. Uh, to join us and learn a little bit about what Rubrik is trying to do to bring speed and certainty to cyber recovery. So with that said, let's go ahead and jump right into our presentation. So backup is not equal to cyber recovery. What does that have to do with threat hunting? Uh, threat hunting is, uh, is a rather broad uh, subject in the, uh, the arena or the arena of security. There's a variety of different, different ways to to perform something as, as a, you know, generic in the broad sense of the term as threat hunting. Well, when we look at ransomware recovery, uh, oftentimes we're gonna have to perform some type of investigation to try and segregate our business data from the threat that is succeeded at encrypting and bringing down, locking down our business data at least once already. So that's the perspective that we, re we refer to with respects to cyber recovery versus traditional recovery, be that a file, a system, or even at a grand scale, the concept of disaster recovery. That preparation is still not, unfortunately, going to allow organizations to be prepared for a encryption event. So as we all know, if you pick up the average paper, uh, businesses are under attack, unfortunately, our customers, Rubrik customers, do get hit by ransomware. And what we found is if, if they can get to the data, then the game's over. And it may only be 0.0001% chance that the attacker is able to get to the data. But the entire game is if the business can't operate, they can extort a ransomware payment. The best way to do that is to lock down not just one, but every copy of data that they can find. This is the point where the ransomware attacker can effectively claim victory. It's only a matter of time before the business is aware there isn't an, an alternative for recovery. We have to unlock our data. This chart here is a representation of vulnerabilities in the uh, NIST National, Vulnerab uh, National Vulnerability Database. And this is really just an eye chart for why has this gotten so much worse in the past five to six years? Ransomware was technically a thing. There are accounts of it going back to the 80s, but never at scale and never with a uh, type of currency that, that allows the, the payment for these type of exploits. So it's a, it's a little bit of a, we have a new way of being able to maybe commit cybercrime from a financial standpoint, but the actual capability to carry out cybercrimes is getting at least with respect to the number of vulnerabilities, the landscape is getting wider. There are more platforms and in these platforms do have more vulnerabilities as their code bases get bigger. So the first thing we need to ask ourselves if we're preparing for recovery is, are we an easy target? Are we gonna be on the buffet menu for a ransomware attacker? Once they get access to our environment and they performed as much lateral movement as possible, 
is this going to be an easy payday for them? Well, first thing you should probably ask yourself is, does your data protection system look a little bit like the architecture on your left? This is your classic two or three tier architecture. Classic also meaning old, legacy, designed for the expectation that a firewall and some routers, some ACLs and VLANs, et cetera, basic traditional security is gonna keep us safe. Our data protection software is likely designed to be able to be written to practically any storage vendor out there. And our data protection storage platform has probably been designed to receive backup copies from any backup software out there. This entire architecture has been built with the concept of sharing. Let's use protocols that everybody understands how to read and receive, and let's use platforms that are ubiquitous for ease of use. This is not a big deal 20 years ago. This is a big deal today because as we do see, attackers have gotten really good at gaining access to the wire and getting inside the perimeter. So if our data protection solutions look, look a little bit like the left, or they have the description that cannot meet the requirements on the right, using open, storage, open protocols for the storage itself, are we running on platforms that are kind of known to be in the, in the ready everyday uh, crosshairs of a ransomware attacker? Is MFA even an option? Can, can we actually deploy a, a time-based password uh, a challenge to ensure that compromised credentials, which are just part and parcel of every ransomware attack these days, isn't just the easy way of logging in to this stack on the left. If you can't compromise it, just steal some credentials, log in and remove backups the old fashioned way. So what we've also heard from customers I'm not, is that I'm not dealing with the infrastructure anymore, the legacy infrastructure. I'm now in the cloud. We see that a lot too. We see a lot of our customers have one leg in the data center, legs in multiple clouds. Maybe they've done a transition into the cloud, but the, the same problems are, are still here. Data can still be accessed, deleted, expired. And while there are multiple copies, these copies are, are usually connected and online still providing an, an attacker if they have gained access to the wire, the potential to expire and delete data. So getting into the concept of backup is, is not equal to cyber recovery. Well, well, what does that really mean, right? Let's, let's say that everything on the left-hand side is good. Even though we've already reviewed, it's a little bit long in the tooth for the type of attack that we need to prepare for today. The type of recovery is gonna be much different as well. It's not going to be the, the old school game of someone lost a file in accounting, recover that file. Maybe that's an arduous task. Maybe it's relatively easy. But the size, the if you will, the gravity of that, of that data, that individual file, not a big deal. If it is a, a rather large amount of data, maybe that's a concern. Maybe it's a lot of series of data and we have to individually march through those, those restore activities. These are still usually day-to-day, -day, not all that much of a problem because we're not facing a challenge that may be as big as our entire data center or a significant portion of our data center. So in cyber recovery, it's not gonna be again, as easy as what do we recover? If we try to paint a, an analogy or a comparison to disaster recovery, when well disaster recovery, it may be a lot of systems, but you know all of them. They are all in the physical location that has a fire, that has a flood that has an earthquake, or there is, an, or there is a potentially a, a hurricane heading towards the location of the data center. It still may be a lot of systems, but it's relatively easy to draw a dotted line around these systems and say, we're gonna have to work on these. Usually in disaster recovery, we're not worried about the hurricane stealing data. Ransomware attackers today do spend as much time as, as reasonably that they can to not only perform lateral movement to lock down as much data as possible, but dig inside that data before you lock it down to see if you may be able to hold an additional ransom as customers such as rubric customers have gotten very capable at being able to recover. This is the second payment that ransomware attackers will try to achieve. So this is a portion of cyber recovery that is just inherently different in cyber recovery that we never really concern ourselves with in disaster recovery. And last but not least is how do you ensure when you are recovering your systems, that you're only recovering business data, that you're not recovering business data that is residing on a compromised platform, i.e. the malware itself. 
These are the challenges that are really germane to the IT staff and the, and the security teams are going to be working hand in hand as they go through this new type of recovery. Another thing that's interesting is that there are folks that generally don't ever talk about data protection, don't ever talk about mass recovery, that now are, because there's a, there's a significant amount more threat as opposed to a fire in the data center, hurricane coming out of the Atlantic. Now, the, these types of data center scale threats can pop up really at any time with, with no notice. So are we good? Can you prove the fact that we can recover? How long will it take? These are straightforward questions, but the answers behind them are extremely, extremely complicated. So the, uh, the approach that Rubrik has here is to try and take uh, one platform to answer all the questions that are needed, fill in all of the blanks that are there in cyber recovery that we generally already have the information to in disaster recovery. The way that we want to do that is cloud, data center, SaaS workloads, doesn't matter. All of them are going to receive an immutable air gapped copy. This is to make sure the data gets safeguarded so we do have at least a chance at recovering from ransomware. But of course, preparation isn't about a chance, it's about, if you will, a fighting chance. So we're also going to need to have some pre-enrichment of this data so we can fill in the blanks immediately and then begin cyber recovery. Well, the best way to fill in this blanks of a, time, uh, a timeline-based attack is to gather timeline information. So as we back up data, we want, when in, we want to not only back up the data, we want to back up the data's metadata and understand that over a time series. So we have modern data protection, encryption detection, sensitive data discovery, threat hunting and quarantining, which we are here to review today, risk assessment on times of recovery and the ability to recover in isolated environments. We put all these together and is what we refer to as the rubric security cloud. Rubrik Security Cloud is effectively a way to, from a SaaS platform, remote control all of these components as they run inside of your data protection solution. So the data doesn't necessarily have to be moved to the cloud. This is just a cloud platform as far as managing your assets and the data that you own inside of your deployments so that you have one single pane for not only the data, but also the information you're going to need to effectively recover that data in a cyber event. So the cyber event, let's talk about the challenge. Why would we need something like threat hunting? Well, let's first take a look at that timeline that we're talking about. So time moves on. We have good business data. Everything's hunky-dory, no signs from the SIM, no EDR alarms, right? Everything's going on. Everything's going on great. And then one day a payload lands, but the EDR keeps on chugging along. SIM keeps on plugging along, no alerts, right? If we're talking about the encryption event, this is the story. There is a attacker on the wire and we weren't aware of it. That's why the encryption event eventually occurred. So as we are unfortunately not aware of this, this particular moment in the story, time does keep on passing. And this is what we refer to as dwell time or what the industry really refers to as dwell time. And during this time is when data exfiltration is going to be uh, performed, is when our systems and our files are going to be analyzed to determine what would be valuable potentially on the open market. Then, of course, the attacker encrypts. This is what we all are well, very well aware of. However, we do not know the point in time of the, pay, of the payload landing. If we did, we would likely have stopped this attack in the first place. So it's not necessarily paradoxical. But of course, we do want to know when that payload landed. We do want to be able to stop this type of event. Encryption inherently means we were not able to. We also know that we are not going to be able to use the points in time that are encrypted, the data that's been backed up. So four years ago, five years ago, when we had our first real rash of modern ransomware attacks, we had customers that were calling in and they were saying, hey, I need a, a lot of help trying to get this system back up. And we would get it restored and they would hang up and everything would be okay. And then they would call in a couple hours later and say, hey, can you help me with that same system? But from a few points in time previous, we would do it, get it, get it, help them get it back up and then hang up two hours later, they're calling right back in. The reason for this is the concept of re-encryption. 
if you have a system that has already been set to encrypt, most ransomware these days is set to auto encrypt as soon as they can determine any type of time source. Once they are aware that the encryption event has already has already occurred, systems will self encrypt. And this is a, a problem because it's very, very tricky to clean malware from a system to ensure that you got all of the malware. So the typical security approach is tried is to try to use a point in time that is prior to compromise. Elsewise, we may have to rebuild systems from scratch, which is not something that we can do in a data center wide emergency. So this timeline, if we do have all of our backups, it is potentially you can view it as a as a, as a good starting point, a land of opportunity. But you may spend a significant amount of time in that land of opportunity trying to determine what snapshots can you rely on, which snapshots have no IOCs or minimal IOCs versus the ones that are obviously littered with the attacker's toolkit. So the approach that most organizations take is we, in, we involve IT ops and we involve SecOps. We have a SecOps team, they understand threats. We have an IT ops team, they understand data. The IT ops team can resurrect data. The SecOps team can scan data. So these two teams basically just work in a loop, just scanning, restoring, scanning, restoring, scanning, restoring, looking for a clean recovery point. We've seen this because, again, our customers have had to call in and ask for repeat help working with particular workloads or significant amounts of workloads. And the only thing we're doing is just rolling back through time, trying to find something that, that sticks, right? Throwing restore points against the wall and finding which one sticks, which one can we use. And this has really exacerbated how long it takes uh, the rubric ransomware response team to open and close a case with uh, one of our customers that does get hit by ransomware. So because of this, we needed to build a solution that would allow our customers to perform this same activity, but without actually having to restore data. So that the IT ops team can potentially not even be involved. And the SecOps team can take what they would be doing anyway, looking for maybe uh, hashes that we can identify as being vulnerable or uh, malicious, should I say, or maybe going a, a little bit further and digging into the contents of our files, going past the signature, looking for in indicators of compromise at a, at a content level inside of a binary, something along those lines. So this is the average data protection solution has backups. But of course, we're looking at rubric here. So we not only get backups, we index everything. So we backup data and we automatically run a process to understand every single file in the environment in those backups. Where are they? What are their names? And also, how are they changing? So you may be aware of our ransomware investigation solution it allows us to look for the changes of a data center in mass and looking for the signs of encryption so we can build out a triage list. We also have sensitive data discovery that allows us to understand what sensitive nature is inside of our data center in the first place. And we do both of these on every single backup. We wanna to try to build the triage list and build the inventory of sensitive data or maybe just confidential data in your environment, every single backup from, as a preparatory step. The last piece here is today an on-demand approach for taking the IOCs that are specific to your attack combing through the calendar, and then allow you to earmark the snapshots that you do want to use, the most recent backups that are free of indicators of compromise. And that's really where threat hunting is for us today, is the IOC that, you, that is germane to you, let's take any of them. We don't want to be tailored to just one type of uh, security vendor's feed. We want to be able to take any type of rule, any type of data level information that you want to process that you want to avoid on recovery and then automate the entire process and also do it in a way that is completely in-house meaning this isn't bolt on software this is rubric authored code which means that it gets the full efficiencies of everything on the left we're going to reuse our own index we're going to reuse our own file system we're going to reuse our own compute to do all of these activities so it's a good way of, of pointing out that we can do all of this without ever affecting production. So if production is down, you can still run threat hunting on all the data that we've already collected. 
Let's say your attack isn't operating system level, it's ESXi level. Well, that ESXi attack was still carried out from some portion, some, some operating system in the environment. We can scan all the data because we've already backed it up to identify which system is compromised versus which system just had the underlying VMDKs encrypted. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and transition out of the presentation here and get into the uh, relatively quick demo. And then we'll walk through how we can use that information uh, from the threat hunting to quickly determine which points in time we need to use. Okay, so we are currently looking at uh, the, the slide with uh, reference rubric security cloud. This is it. So as I mentioned, it is a, a SaaS based control platform. That's the cloud aspect of it. So not rubric cloud hosted data, more a rubric cloud hosted user interface so that you can manage the deployments that you have in your physical data centers or potentially in your virtualized hyperscale data centers. So everything on the left-hand side is about data protection, getting that incremental forever, encrypted, immutable, deduplicated, et cetera, copy of data. Right-hand side is all about using that data, either in mass application recovery, mass VM recovery there, data discovery, or today's topic, threat hunting, which is going to be under ransomware investigation for us. So we've got 22 systems that are showing uh, an anomalous state of events. Let's go ahead and get inside the investigation window where we do have threat hunting. The default window is just going to show us all systems that are showing uh, encryption-based anomalies. So the just the file system anomalies while we're looking at this page are over here, these three columns, deleted, added, and modified. But we'll also want to measure the changes of files to those to the file contents. If it if it is a file that's changing, and it is changing to a highly randomized state, we'll apply a suspicious tag to it. So the first part of this UI is focused on identifying what may need to be recovered. The second part is focusing on identifying the points in time to recover those systems to. So we hop into threat hunts and we'll get a listing of the threat hunts we've already kicked off. And we can kick off a new uh, threat hunt by clicking start threat hunt here. Now, this is the point that I usually try to advertise that we understand there is no need for one more console, one more point security product that takes learning, a little bit of training that security operators have to understand how to use. The, con the, the uh, term uh, console fatigue is, is pretty, sp is pretty uh, common in uh, security operators jargon just because there are a lot of solutions out there that are often can be deployed in mass in an individual organization because of that organizations have a lot of uh, automation in place some sometimes in-house sometimes productized by way of a SOAR platform the good news is that whichever way the organization wants to work with their security apparatus we do support those types of opportunities. So if we have a SOAR in-house, we can use a SOAR to remote control the execution and getting the result of a threat hunt. Same thing if we are interested in using Python, PowerShell, GraphQL calls, Ansible Salt, all that jazz. Rubrica is API first, which allows us to make sure that everything that we write can be automated by our end users. So it would not be all that tricky to either be from a SOAR platform or command line to say, I wanna start a new threat hunt. And in that initial command that you would pass, you would say what type of threat hunt you wanna execute. So if it's a file hash, just give us a listing of file hashes in the body. Or if you're using a YAR rule, just paste in a series of YAR rules that you would like to execute against your data. I'm going to come in here to our little example just to get a YAR rule to work with. The idea here is that we want to provide a, a security analyst what they already know, just a way to plug in what they're trying to search for, but now a very, very easy way for them to sweep the data center. We click next, we choose a data center, right? The biggest object that we have. So if we're working in Austin, let's go ahead and select Austin data center. Next up. 
we want to make sure they don't have to know anything about backups. So we're not going to tell them a whole lot of things about backups. We're just going to present the objects that we are protecting. So if I know that I'm trying to perform some threat hunting against uh, maybe 50 or 60 VMs, we can view them either by how they are be being protected, or their, the concept of the SLA domain, or maybe just their individual type of objects. And so maybe we just want to work with vSphere VMs here, search for them by name if we need to. But the point being is that we're just going to present a list of the objects in their kind of a normal format, just their normal names. And then you just tell Rubrik how much time you want to search through. So we'll give it a name. In this case, we're just going to be looking for our encryption simulation script that we have. By default, we would just scan the most recent snapshot. This is the default because customers generally have large questions around their data that are not specific to a ransomware attack or that are not specifically after a ransomware attack. So if you want to do something like double check your data center for log4j, you probably cleaned it up a year ago, but it also happens to get downloaded relatively often. 40% of all log4j downloads last year were the unpatched versions. So that's an example of why you may want to take something you've already done and you've already spent time on the front end of your data center performing and spending resources, scanning, remediating, et cetera. Use Rubrik as a copy of all that work to check it, to double check it, validate that you still do not have any hashes that are associated with log4j packages. Or in this case, we chose Yara rules. We can use Yara rules as an opportunity to look inside of a jar file to see if a package of Java may contain log4j inside of it. The custom time range approach is more specific to indicators of compromise, either ones that are, are predating an actual event ahead of the, the actual compromise of the event. If we do find maybe on one system, a system has been compromised, but there hasn't been any immediate damage, you're likely gonna under, want to understand, well, where else may be this ind indicator of compromise that has not yet caused damage? Well, because we can go wide, we'll tell you where anything may be, but because we can also go back in time, we can also tell you how long it's been around, system by system. So this would allow you to potentially track across time which systems are receiving indicators of compromise at what point in time, because we are going to be looking at them from a, a data level perspective. And this could potentially allow you to understand where the first candidate was, where the, where the first victim was, and then how lateral movement uh, progressed just from a, a data mapping perspective. If you're post-encryption, the approach here would simply just be find the most recent snapshot that does not have a match, that does not show an indicator of compromise. Last but not least, if the security operator knows anything about the actual package itself, does it ever get above a certain file size? Well, let's not uh, waste time scanning files over five megs. Just in this particular example, you can increase this really as large as you know your max file size may be include or exclude files, right? Just make the scan be more focused so we can get to the end of the scan a little faster. Hit start, and that's the full setup. So the whole idea here is bring your own IOC to the table. On the other end of that, while that may be a semi-manual transmission, bring the IOC to the table. It's attached to an engine that can actually handle as much shifting as you would like to do, if you'll allow that analogy. We have the ability to dedicate every single node in the cluster to a, a single scan of a single file, if that's as large as the scan is. So if it's just one object, the entire cluster participates. If it's a lot of objects, you probably want the entire cluster to participate. Good. It does by default. That's because it is written by Rubrik, and it does understand how to get uh, inserted and interact with the rest of the systems in the platform. So we're going to move on into the results. So I'm going to scan down here to one that does have some files we've already quarantined. So we jump in here. We have two servers that we've already worked with. I see that because we have our little indicator here showing that the time, the time range over here on the right, representing which snapshots had a match, which snapshots did not have a match, have already been taken offline. So that if I wanted to move forward with recovery, I could do so and have rubric 
basically wave a magic wand and avoid for these two systems the time range that has been quarantined. So for demonstration purposes, let's go ahead and remove the quarantine so we can start from the beginning. So we come in here and we're going to say we're going to remove the quarantine. And so if our scan had just finished, this would be effectively what it would look like. We can see how the scan uh, performed, how at what, at what point in snapshots were scanned, was it successful, failed, were any matches found per snapshot. Left-hand side, we can see about how long the, the scan took. And under parameters, we can see how we configured this particular scan, what we were scanning for, which systems we were scanning, and what type of rule we used. Back to the results, if we hop into a given system, we'll check out the second one. We can see this is our file, wannacry basically .exe, did match the wannacry yar rule that we ran against it. The reason we did all of that is so we can find what snapshots are available that do not contain this file. Pretty, pretty basic, right? If we're gonna recover this system, we do not want to recover, in this case, obviously, the WannaCry with it. So because of the nature of ransomware, it wouldn't be as easy as just looking for WannaCry.exe. They change names often. You could use hashes. They change signatures often, which is why the, the YAR rule is kind of the de facto framework of security analysts today. So our threat hunting support in rubric is very much that, quite literally threat hunting support. We're taking the activity that someone could take potentially with a, uh, a maybe a Sentinel-1, maybe a CrowdStrike. They have the ability to run threat hunting. They have the ability to execute YAR rules, but they do this against the front end of the system, our current running copy. To do that against a legacy copy of data, that data does have to be restored. So we're trying to take that restore out and allow the, the same type of analysis that top line EDR tools can run on current copies of data and allow the same type of execution on previous copies of data without ever having to restore it. Plug in the rule, plug in the time frame, which systems, and we'll do, if you will, the dirty work. So we can quarantine systems by a file time range. So for this particular system, in this case, I only have one file. So I would naturally want to quarantine the entire time range of this file. However, if I'm a security analyst, maybe I want to research and investigate portions of the toolkit. Maybe I'm not interested in understanding the WannaCry piece. I know that very well. I'm trying to understand an additional component of the toolkit, and I want to isolate that particular file. If it has a different time range, that's why we allow you to do a time range quarantine based on a individual file or groups of files. So you can select the files that you want to avoid, include the files that you want to keep, and then just quarantine what you want to make sure you do, you do not reintroduce. So we're going to go back here to the top of all objects. We're going to come in here and go ahead and quarantine this system and its match snapshots as well. There we go. All right, so we have three systems that we need to recover. So let's just go ahead and hit recover these systems. Then we're gonna come in here into start cyber recovery. So start cyber recovery has a, a handful of, of, of advantages for us. Number one, it'll allow us to just go ahead and quickly pick a point in time that we would like to use for recovery. So let's say we want to use non-quarantined and non-anomalous snapshots. This would effectively mean systems that uh, have snapshots available that have not been encrypted and are not quarantined, meaning they do not show the signs of encrypted data. And after security review, there is there are snapshots available for us to push online. In this case, we selected the most recent snapshot that we have for these two systems that is not quarantined. It's back on the 6th. This particular object just doesn't have one because of a, just our, the way our lab's working right now. No qualified snapshots found. We could try and select one if there was one available, but in our lab, this uh, VM just isn't really going to work for us. However, we could just do something like do not consider, and it will say, well, there's a snapshot that's quarantined. You, if you're a security operator, you could recover it, 
But for this particular VM, if we do look for snapshots that are not quarantined, unfortunately for this one, there is not one available. So what this filter does is it basically looks at the tags, the tags that have been applied to the systems. The anomalous tag is applied automatically by rubric. This is the encryption detection piece that runs on every single backup. The quarantine tag can be applied for systems that have a threat hunting result on them. So just to get through this portion of the UI, we're gonna move with do not consider, and we're gonna hit our vCenter. So which vCenter would we wanna use? Well, we have our prod one up front. Maybe we don't wanna restore into prod. Isolated recovery is very, very common with organizations these days. Even if we have validated the information in rubric, if we've already threat hunted on the data, we still maybe want to turn it on, isolate it, double check it before we do push it into a live environment. For that, we can select a brand new vCenter, select a new data center associated with it. Make sure we actually click the button. Click next, and then we can choose what network we would want to put these systems in. As I was mentioning, maybe we want to put it into an isolation zone first. So we can re recover these VMs, power them up, give them a review with the security team, and then move them into production as needed. If the VMs need to be powered up in a specific order, if there's dependencies with the systems as far as making sure their applications do work, then you may want to apply a order as far as which systems boot up in what order, and you can issue you can issue some timings as far as how many seconds to wait in between boots if if it's uh, specific to your environment. One more opportunity, if there's any customization scripts that need to be run on your system, you can declare those here, completely optional. And the last optional step is to save this plan in the future. So this is the example of your cyber attack may not be one-to-one -one with your DR plan. Well, if there's an opportunity to improve the DR plan based on what you've learned in cyber recovery, by way of what order things need to be booted in or any customization scripts that need to be run, just as examples, you can go ahead and save this plan so that you could use it in the future. If this is just a one-off test, you're not actually probably gonna put these into production. Maybe you are just doing investigations. You don't have to save the plan. You can just move forward and kick off a recovery. So that's the uh, rough idea of threat hunting here today. The idea is you bring an IOC to the table, we will do all the hard work. Instead of having to recover data, we'll, we'll comb through the data inside of our platform. Unfortunately, because of the way that rubric stores data incrementally forever, once we get past to the, to the stage of incremental backups, we can review just change files over time and not rescan files over and over and over as we are trying to march back through time to determine what data is what. What data is a mixture of our data plus IOCs. And depending on the amount of retention that we're keeping, what data do we have that is free IOCs? There's, a, there's oftentimes opportunity to use a relatively old system state that is known as safe and bring it back up to speed with patches and business data that we can either apply from public resources, as far as patches coming down from our, from our vendors, and as far as business data, that can be re replayed either through Rubrics database recovery or unstructured data recovery opportunities. So I'm gonna go ahead and check the chat real quick to see if there's any questions. The first one is, are there some templates from Rubric that we can use for threat hunts? So the, temp the, the templates for a threat hunting would be pretty, uh, uh, I guess, almost one-to-one -one with what are you hunting for. So the easiest way to get a, a, a template of something like a Yara rule is going to be a variety of different public resources. So Google being uh, one of the best ones, honestly. If you look for GitHub Yara rule, you will find a variety of different repositories that you can use. If you're looking for something that's a little bit more just plug and play from, a, from an attacker perspective, there is Malpedia, which is a basically a search engine that you can use if you type in a, a ransomware attacker's uh, uh, 
uh, toolkits or sometimes just their name, you can uh, re receive Yara rules. And there is also, so here, abuse.ch, I believe. Oh, I didn't get that right. Yeah, uh, abuse, uh, Yarify, the library is available from abuse sh as well, as far as uh, searching the, the, the public, you know, uh, ocean that is uh, Yara rules available. Uh, Fabri Fabricio, I'm not sure if I answered your question there, but as, as far as uh, a, how do I use this this engine? It is really about what are you trying to scan for? For the YAR rule approaches, uh, these three websites are pretty good as far as taking a look at what security researchers are finding in the wild today and the rules that they're publishing as far as tracking. Uh, we have a, a question about, does Rubik have a knowledge base for threat intelligence fees that continuously publish and update YAR scripts for file hashes? Uh, not today. Uh, as, as I was mentioning, our approach here is instead of building an automatic transmission, which is a public feed of YAR rules that is attached to a rinky dink engine that can only scan maybe two systems at a time. What's the point in that? The, our capability to scan is going to be largely dependent on how fast and how efficiently can we churn through all this data. So for the past year, our original solution was focused on VMware and file sets. We've expanded that from VMware to AHV, Hyper-V file sets, as well as physical systems. Cloud VMs being the next portion of expansion as far as what systems we can threat hunt on. Last but not least, archive locations. As we are working on it, on taking the engine's uh, uh, capabilities and compatibilities and expanding it to include not just on-prem, but also cloud-based assets, bringing in a, uh, a Yara rule fee that is curated by Rubrik and can be used for, for, for proactive scanning is on our roadmap. And I do, and our, I mean, our more near-term roadmap, not multi-year roadmap. However, again, we need to be able to make sure that the amount of information that may be coming from said feed can be efficiently processed and not just against one, two, or a, or a very, very, very small subset of information. So a long way of saying, not today, roadmap, but I want to provide a little bit of a explanation into why we are where we are in, in the story so far. Uh, Alberto is asking for, say I want to research previous hunts for IOCs, files, or Yara rules performed. Is there a way to query a hunt performed? Uh, the, the searching for and some more advanced management of hunts as they have been kicked off, that's, a, that's a, a lot more immediate roadmap for us. Today, you can download any of the results of uh, a, a, a completed Yara, uh, excuse me, a completed scan just in a CSV format. So which systems, and you can also get CSVs for the contents of those systems. And this information can also be sent over to a SIM. So we do get record, record keeping and we can reuse previous hunts, polish them up and scan them all over again. Doing that in the UI is currently being worked on. The uh, stop gap is, that we put out is the uh, that CSV download primarily. So we can also get it sent over into SIMs for the result of the scans. And then Albert, Alberto asked a follow-up question, what is the retention policy for, for the hunts performed? Today, it is 30 days. And that's uh, mostly just from a, uh, a, a metric of the, the storage that, uh, that it takes to hold all of the hunts for our customers. Today, it's 30. We do have, a, we do have expand, uh, plans to expand that. Also, a reason why we have the CSV download approach for any hunts that we do want to keep uh, for more legacy uh, standpoints. And again, send them to your Sims where you can keep them as long as you would like. Uh, Bill Hagen uh, mentioned threat hunt option doesn't appear in ransomware monitoring investigations. Doesn't matter if I'm logged in as SSO local or owner. Uh, Bill, we have had a relatively recent backlog of provisioning uh, the threat hunting feature. If you recently uh, either purchased rubric or potentially upgraded to the enterprise edition, and you do, you do not have threat hunting even with all of the permissions out there, uh, please contact your account team. Uh, there is a known fix and that known fix is actually being rolled out. So you you may be on the list of the, the fixed list for where the original provisioning 
was not completed uh, uh, as expected. Um, if you do not have Enterprise Edition, that's where threat hunting uh, does get delivered as far as that provisioning process. Uh, and I'd say probably just within the last two months, if you made a purchase, it, you may have fallen into that window where provisioning may or may not have been successful. Um, and Bill, please uh, uh, feel free to, to uh, ask a follow-up question in there if, you, if there's any more information that we can review there as far as why the, the Threat Hunt tab is not available for you. Uh, Fabricio, thanks for the follow-up here um, as far as making sure I answered your question. So I really do appreciate that. And uh, okay, sorry, sorry, I do see Bill, you followed up. We used to have Threat Hunt. Okay, so you used to have Threat Hunt, now, now you're not seeing it. Um, yeah, I would definitely double check to see if something may have occurred on the on the back end. Um, and the good news about any about all of these features is that they really are just feature flags. So any rubric account out there, if you wanted to know, you know, what type of features do I have in my environment? Here are the features currently enabled in this particular rubric security cloud environment. And I'm not gonna go into what these mean. That part doesn't matter. The point that I'm trying to illustrate is that a concept such as ransomware investigation, sensitive data discovery, threat hunting, these are features that just get turned on because all they do is just ride on top of the greater platform that we have developed, the platform that is actually running in each one of these locations. So if there is any issue there, Bill, we can certainly get that turned around pretty quick. No technical hurdles just need to uh, see why it's not showing up in your UI. Uh, don't see any problems there as far as a technical challenge. Uh, Blake has asked, how many systems or terabyte is it reasonable to expect a scan against all VMs should work? Uh, how many at a time, essentially? Uh, Blake, gr great question. So if we say, just to expand your question a little bit, let's say that you we wanted to scan not only all your systems, we want to scan all your systems for every YAR rule known to mankind. That would kind of be boiling the ocean. Better yet, it would be exponentially boiling the ocean. So there's not a shortcut here as far as one copy of the data and trying to look at its contents, scanning using a YAR rule for content-based or just quickly executing a hash calculation for signature-based. That part is kind of the same for everybody. You have to look at the data. Now, if you have additional insights, maybe we can choose whether to look at the data or not. Those insights may be location of the file, size of the file. You may have that information, you may not have that information. Fortunately at Rubrik, we always have that information. It's already gathered. So we can just tell a scan, I'm looking for an IOC, this is the R rule, by the way, most YAR rules include a specific file size to match against. So if the file doesn't match the file size, that resource intensive process just isn't run. So I bring this example up because the more information that you can apply to the scan, the faster that scan will go. So the, the one that we were looking at previously was three systems, I think about 20 snapshots, took a half hour. There is a, a little bit of, of, of a baseline time because we have to perform that initial scan. Once we get to the point of working through time, this is when Rubrik can start to take shortcuts other solutions can't because we already have a track. We already have a record, an immutable record of what files have changed over time. So if I wanna scan a system today, maybe I'm just as fast as your current approach of scanning that system today. As soon as we need to scan two copies, I'll scan today, and then I will intelligently only scan the difference of today versus yesterday. The alternative approach would be to scan the system of yesterday all over again, and then compare results. So there's two different ways that we can make sure that we are faster. So faster than status quo is gonna be not having to scan everything. And the way that we, we accomplish that is an incremental forever approach to not scanning everything. We will only scan data that has changed as we go back in time. And the other is just awareness of what you may wanna to, want to scan that you know about. If you know that your, your file or your, your target is not over a certain amount of size, 
we've already categorized all the sizes of files inside of rubric. So we'll quickly avoid those. Same thing with location, same thing with name. So if you do have something that is everything for everything, we're gonna go back to that boiling the ocean approach. It's gonna be so variable that I can't really give you a, a clean answer. But if we start to define some of those answers, I can give you some good examples. So we, in our, in our, uh, in our lab, we recently kicked off a scan of about 600 snapshots. Uh, it was about two months of time, but what matters is 600 snapshots. The systems in this experiment were pretty basic, about 30 gig systems, but we were able to scan 600 snapshots in less than an hour. The reason for that is because we knew a little bit of information about what file we were trying to track. In this case, we knew the extension, that's it. We knew we were looking for a shell file. So we searched the entire environment for shell files, most of the environment is not shell files. So we didn't even have to scan it in the first place. So with that type of example, we can churn through a significant amount of data with respects to time, because we've already gathered the, the metadata about the data, location, size, et cetera, so that we can intelligently scan it or not scanning it, not scan it, depending on what we know about the system. Usually when we're dealing with an indicator of compromise, the indicator, is relatively specific. It's not, we're looking for this hexadecimal range across every file in the data center, binary files and MP3s. We're not gonna be scanning MP3s, right? So let's go ahead and take those files right off the table. Just as another example of, while we do have a data center, we don't have a data center full of files that are likely to be malicious. Malicious files do have a characteristic to them so the more of those characteristics that we can apply to our particular brand of malware, more data can be excluded from the scan and the faster the scan will proceed. So that's the, uh, the kind of honest approach as far as how long is this going to take? Well, it's the ocean. You do have to boil it. The, the best way to do it is to intelligently select what data you have to boil versus what data you can leave alone. Let me know if that makes sense, Blake. Ah, follow up, yeah. Uh, is there a dynamic list of the most common YAR rules being matched today in environments? Uh, not today, since they are uh, user uh, initiated. We don't have uh, ready access into what YAR rules our customers are running. So again, we're not necessarily here to detect and prevent. We're not playing law enforcement today. We're still playing responder and trying to understand, you know, where is this, that where is the code that is causing the problem after the problem has occurred? We have plans to work on the front end, work ahead in a more detect proactive aspect. But unfortunately today our customers get hit by ransomware and they've invested with Rubrik to help them recover from ransomware. Our first iteration of threat hunting is, is very much focused on that recovery aspect, making sure that we can process all your rules across the table. Uh, and scans get faster going forward. Uh, yes, I mean, the, uh, the, the good nature of, uh, of having every, everything written in-house by rubric is that there are efficiencies just by way of software updates. Uh, we have had some, uh, some pretty good uh, testing as far as what priority should threat hunting run at. Uh, that was increased because we saw that we were uh, leaving some resources on the table as far as the, the, the priority that it was previously running in some old amount of code. So just within the last year, we've already had some uh, reasonable speed improvements to threat hunting. Uh, and we do plan on the overall process uh, getting more efficient before we take on that concept of proactive, where there are where, where, where we are going to get closer to that concept of, of, of boiling the ocean on each scan. All right, so we got about five minutes left. Uh, checking the chat and the Q and A one more time. Uh, thank you for uh, for everybody for for joining. Really appreciate the time. Sorry for the heavy presentation on the front end, but as you've seen through the demo, it's a pretty straightforward solution. Bring your IOC. That part is not necessarily turnkey, but oftentimes once IOCs have been found, how do you wield them? How do you take that information that you now know about one system and understand its nature across the data center? Most customers don't have a turnkey solution to do that. 
most customers wouldn't buy a point solution to do that. So we understood the need, but also the, the landscape and tried to say, you know what, this is a feature that we can just run directly on our, our appliance. And because our customers, sadly, unfortunately, do get hit by ransomware, it is something that we uh, use in every one of our response teams. So whenever a customer does get hit by ransomware, we understand that uh, time is of the essence. So we do uh, usually end up running threat hunting as a way to understand which snapshots we can rely on. So just to say, we uh, we do use this in-house when our customers do sadly still get hit by ransomware. So thank you everybody for joining. Really appreciate the time. We'll give you a, a few minutes back in your day. Thank you, Adam, for such an insightful session. This concludes today's webinar, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today for this fantastic virtual event. And thank you again to our partner, Rubric. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day.